Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar featuring a discussion with USAID's Transform Wash about business models for market-based sanitation in Ethiopia. As you may have noticed, our webinar today is snack-sized with two brief presentations followed by Q&A. We aim to keep this webinar under 45 minutes, so please be ready with your questions for when we turn to that portion of the agenda. My name is Kay D from the Global Waters Communications and Knowledge Management Project, and I, along with my colleague Joelle, will be available if you have any technical questions during today's event. You can either type your questions in the chat box or in the Q&A box, both of which are located on the right-hand side of your screen. Our first presentation today will be from Monty Achenbach, Chief of Party for Transform Wash in Ethiopia, and then Dagam Demiro, Transform Wash's Associate Director of Wash Business Development. And so with that, I'd like to hand it over to Monty to kick us off. Thank you, Katie, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world today. Really pleased to be with you and tell you a little bit about the business models that we've been uh, developing uh, through Transform Wash over the last few years. Uh, next slide. So just a quick briefer on the program itself. Uh, we're now in our sixth year, uh, started back in January of 2017, and we'll go through this December, but it looks like we'll be uh, moving on a little bit longer uh, over the next year and a half or so uh, with, a, with an, a further extension. This program is implemented by PSI Ethiopia and with our consortium members, Plan International, SNV and IRC, WASH. And the approach, uh, hopefully many of you know about Transform WASH, is to test and develop market-based models um, all designed to increase the use of basic sanitation products and services along households in Ethiopia. So what are the ingredients of market development? We're able to cover what we see as all of the key ingredients uh, to, to expand the market. Of course, the first two are fundamental to economics, supply and demand. So we aim to improve the supply of wash product cho choices more innovative technologies and financing for both businesses and consumers in more places. Wouldn't do much good to have improved supply if you don't have sustained demand. So demand is obviously an important part of this activity as well. We want more and more customers to have access to low cost quality wash products and services. And we design these through user-centered marketing techniques, among other techniques. Um, the market in Ethiopia, uh, it, well, anywhere really, but especially in Ethiopia, wouldn't grow if we didn't have an enabling environment that was conducive to that growth. So strengthening that environment for wash market growth through engagement with the One Wash National Program and uh, through Government of Ethiopia capacity building are key elements of this as, as well. Lastly, we all want to learn, right? That's what we're doing here today. So we do research, research, action research, other kinds of research as well to adapt our program, disseminate our learnings, and of course, ultimately to scale our approaches. Next slide. So a little bit of history of what we found when we got started. We've really been, this is a great example of learning by doing. Um, we saw what you see here on the right of the screen, a lot of existing business development efforts focused on these cement slabs. And you guys have, if any of you have heard me uh, present in the past, I talk about this Sherlock Holmes mystery of the disappearing lids. Cement lids that disappear from the moment they're produced uh, to when the slabs are installed. So we have a very large installed base in the country of these slabs with open holes that, you know, protect somewhat from disease, but are not a good customer experience. You still have smell, flies. Uh, it's, it's not the solution that we'd like to see ideally. Um, about 40% of the businesses that we identified as partners uh, have been operating two years or less. So these are relatively new, newly established businesses, but they do have some experience for the most part. Only about 7% had significant experience in sanitation construction itself. They may have experienced a lot of other kinds of construction, but not in sanitation 
uh, in general. And lastly, there were very few product options and, and really none for upgrading uh, rudimentary toilets that you find through CLTSH and other approaches. So in the beginning, our first learning really was based on our initial solution, which was this pictured here, training existing slab producers to embed their cement slabs with this bright blue, pretty product you see here called the Satopan. Um, maybe as close to some kind of a, a magic bullet as you might be able to find. Um, it closes automatically. It's easy to clean, easy to install, embed, and solves a lot of issues that customers complain about. Like I was saying earlier, smell and flies and other, other issues. Um, so, so we looked at customer experience with these. And in the beginning, early on, we found that um, in surveying about 90 households in the southern part of the country, there was a lot of do-it-yourself installation of these satopans, up to about 80% or so, and really questionable quality, as you see pictured here. Um, I would say it's a bit of an upgrade from what they had before, um, but you could never say that this is basic sanitation, uh, according to many definitions, including uh, the definitions of the Ethiopian government. So with that, though, we saw quite high levels of customer satisfaction with the product. May not be installed so well, but customers really seem to like it. Um, and after purchase, nearly all customers wanted to make even further improvements, which is a big change from a population that really didn't think much about investing their hard-earned resources into sanitation. Next slide, thank you. Um, so some of the early results um, that we that we had were really there were a limited number of existing businesses to do the work, focusing on the cement slabs, and a lack of expansion space and the molds you see pictured here uh, to be able to to uh, sell these products to customers. There was also limited production capacity. Things like curing time, transport of these heavy products were a barrier. And as a result, we saw pretty slow demand and sales growth um, due to a large extent to the high price, but to these other issues of transportation as well. So our analysis on this was that customers wanted to build on what they had already. Um, they were willing to pay for low cost upgrades, not high cost solutions. And while they may aspire to a concrete slab or even something better than that, more complete than that, they were reluctant to pay uh, for that leap in the beginning. Next slide. So we worked with our business partners to innovate. We asked them to look at what some alternatives to these cement slabs might be that were more responsive to where con consumers were, what they were willing to spend, what they already had installed, and, and how much they would um, take that leap that I talked about. So one of the, the innovations that we, we uh, developed with them was segmented services. So door-to-door -door sales and installation that would meet customers where they were and look at what they had and design a solution for them and be able to convince them right on the spot using other neighbors' experiences as part of that to convince them. Um, we offered, our business partners offered a range of retrofitting options. So not just one big slab, but things like uh, installing set of pans in existing cement slabs, doing retrofits of existing toilets, um, a whole range of, of different ways to be able to adapt what they had already at a much lower cost. Of course, there was still room for more advanced construction and for businesses who were prepared to do that, who had the skills, they, we did work with them to develop uh, alternatives at higher, rev, high, higher value and revenues, um, but our focus really shifted much more to the door-to-door -door, uh, direct installation. Uh, next slide. So here's a quick list of what was developed, and I'm gonna turn it over to Dagan now to talk about our business models and the approach and how it shifted and evolved um, through the years to meet consumers where they were. Dagam, over to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Monte, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, just to continue from what Monte has left, uh, uh, 
based on the experience that we had on the field, we try to learn adapt and scale. So we have we had different kind of uh, smaller uh, experiences here and there, and uh, people were trying to come up with new kind of, uh, of, of options. So we help them to uh, adapt. We adapt them and we help them to scale. So we we basically came up with four uh, kind of uh, business models. The first one is uh, based on the product options that they offer. The first one is like the advanced manufacturing construction. The second one is basic manufacturing and installation. The third one is what Monte has uh, mentioned in earlier slide, door to door simple upgrade. And the, for, the, for the final one was plastic snap cells and installation. So basically the first model uh, deal with uh, products like uh, complete floors uh, and advanced manufacturing and it needs uh, at least a big uh, bigger enterprises enterprise uh, providing full uh, product option for rural and urban households uh, which has which doesn't have uh, toilets or which has uh, which has uh, unimproved toilets then a bit skilled uh, version of this advanced product manufacturing and construction is a basic product manufacturing and installation which doesn't really need a lot of capital to start to, to start with uh, and only require a smaller space uh, and uh, really, uh, depend, the major kind of products are concrete slab, which are very small and can be uh, fitted in an uh, existing toilets. The third one, which which is really the focus of our uh, our uh, our presentation here today, which is door to door simple upgrade, because you know, like there was a lot of uh, a big implementation of sale before before we, the, our project starts, and there were a lot of basic latrines all over and mainly people doesn't really want to have a big expenditure at the start so this was really a, a, a model that fits to the context and uh, which 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 is really growing a lot so it involves you know uh, independent mess and going door to door conducting their own uh, demand creation and based on the demand creation conducting uh, doing the, the installing the subtle part uh, it has got two kind of you know uh, two kind of benefits one is you know like the amount of revenues as they get you know f uh, when promoters go around and what they get from promotion alone is really very small and it was not really interesting for sales agents you know to, to be to engage in but when masons are engaged you know they they get uh, two uh, business you know like, for, uh, income from both uh, Commission from selling the sato part and also from installation. So it was this was attractive from the business side. From the customer side, it was really attractive because uh, the customer was reached at doorstep and it just minimized uh, the burden of customer go going around collecting uh, uh, construction inputs and buying the sato part. So it just minimized the burden of the customer and it was, it was really. Uh, attractive for both uh, both ends. Then the final one is plastic product sales and support, which is like a major uh, business type, which supports all that all kind of uh, business models that we have. You know, because these products and other construction materials need to be uh, need to be accessible for uh, for them. So here are the list of the products and services offered by uh, each business type. As I mentioned, advanced manufacturers really focus on more advanced options for households. And basic manufacturers really focus on the smaller uh, floor options. Mason installers really are focused on door to door promotion and installation of products. And retailers supply uh, affordable sanitation products for all these uh, involved with business, business types and also for di the direct sell for uh, working customers. Uh, besides this, you know, we, we have got other uh, supply chain established to. Uh, for these products and uh, products to reach at customers' doorsteps, you know, at, at retailers. So we have got large suppliers, so uh, large scale manufacturers, importers, uh, including uh, Lixil and Seal Africa, who works with us to supply plastic products. We have got distributors at provincial uh, towns, you know, who serve uh, a lot of retailers, you know, retailers around them. Then we do have retailers who are, who are basically small hardware shop. Uh, who sells uh, products to both businesses and households. Um, so when we see, you know, like when we see the general, how many businesses that are involved, uh, I mean, we see a very exciting trend. Uh, as you can see, like we, we can, we can, we, we do have close to 439 business partners uh, in the 57 uh, districts that we are operating. 
uh, now the almost 60 percent of our businesses are masons and it just tells us you know like the business is really uh, working well for them and you know uh, uh, so we have got also retailers and distributors and advanced basic manufacturers as you can see you know initially that was not the story you know because we we used to have a lot of retailers and retailers and advanced and basic manufacturers but through time as we adapted to, to this total and installations and sales the portion the proportion of uh, mason installers that evolved in the business is really growing and now they account for 60 percent of our businesses that are operating uh, also the sales and you know like the business operation is also related uh, to 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 the number of businesses that we have now in average uh, uh, transform wash uh, in, uh, the businesses that works with transform wash uh, there's close to 5000 products and uh, services uh, per month so almost more than 70 percent is accounted by mason uh, just taking out the business to business sales but that was not also the story before that now the the pro the the contribution of masons to the business and to access to uh, basic sanitation for household is really increasing through time. And also, it's the same when you see, uh, like, the proportion is close to 60% of the sales come from masons. And also, in average, when you see, like, uh, monthly, the they, 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 they retailers serve 35 to 50 customers per month, but this includes business to business. Uh, sales to manufacturers sales uh, serves up across 20 to 25 customers and uh, masons serve to up from 10 to 20 customers per month and when we see the profitability and um, the business viability uh, as you can see still uh, the door to door upgrade is the most viable one because the the proportion of uh, revenue like to uh, profit is very high the profit margin is close to 50 percent uh, and there is also a lot of business potential for mason installers. Uh, but besides that, you know, uh, the one thing that is really vital for for us is, you know, because we can make we can ensure quality of installation um, and uh, by engaging masons. And we know where uh, products are sold and where installation is made, and the quality of installation could be ensured by strengthening the capacity of masons that are involved in in this process. Uh, so when we see the business retention, uh, it's quite uh, uh, good to see that masons are really the, uh, those that are sustainably continuing the business. Only see uh, the default, like those businesses that uh, stop the op operating are only 60% for mason, for others it's 24%, for advanced and basic manufacturing is 31%, and total 80%. Uh, the retention rate for business for the past five years in transform wash is uh, 80%. But as you can see, like this door-to-door -door upgrade and uh, uh, sales model is really working because uh, the retention rate is in a very, very high for masons and those involved in this kind of business. Uh, so saying this, you know, like just to finalize by, uh, by giving what we have been what been doing and the contributions that Transformers has made on overall access to basic sanitation for rural households in Ethiopia, almost uh, by the end of August, close to 175,000 toilets has been sold, excluding business to business. So it means like close to 175,000 households has got access uh, through purchasing their toilets, and uh, on average, uh, each this, each of these for 439. Uh, 439 businesses have sold, have sold almost close to 225 toilets so far. There are close to 22 types of product and uh, services that has recorded sales, type of product and services. And as of 2022, Mason is account almost for 60, more than 60% of uh, the sales that's happening in uh, across Transform Wash project. So by saying this, I would like to conclude the presentation for, and get back to you. Thank you. And I'd like to, um, I'd also like to extend a very, very warm uh, appreciation to USAID for its support for this activity over the years. Um, in incredible attention to the detail of, of the program and, um, and, and support from, from 
all quarters, um, whether in DC, whether in country, um, really grateful for all, of, all the support we've had and, and great ideas and guidance um, to, to support this evolution of our program. All right, with that, let us open it up to Q&A. Um, Monty, if you'd like to come off of uh, on video as well, then uh, we can get started. Um, we have a number of questions in the Q&A box. Uh, if you're having any trouble finding it, again, it's on the right side of your screen. Um, so the first question that I wanted to share, uh, I think broadly captures something that's on a lot of the audience's mind, which is how would the Ethiopia experience specifically be relevant to other contexts? I think it's, it's, I mean, obviously there are many things that would be different. Um, you know, we have a unique uh, set of uh, policies and policy actors in the government. We have a, a unique place that the, um, that the economy is, um, it could be quite different than, than other countries. Um, the, the level of um, involvement of government in Ethiopia is quite high. That may be quite different than other places, but I think the commonalities um, are, I think this issue of being able to understand what customers want and need and starting from there. I, I think when you start with presuppositions um, about the solution, and I've seen this in, in other countries where there's an assumption that households want, say, a, a maximum uh, response, and, uh, you know, the, the, the best quality toilet you can find, um, something that we would, all, we would all think maybe as outside observers is um, the kind of perfect solution for a household. And I think if you start there, and this is a lesson we've learned in Ethiopia and I think does apply elsewhere, if, if you start there, um, you can immediately um, close the space for expanding the market uh, because, you know, customers are just not necessarily ready to start where we think they should or we would like them to be. And I think this incremental approach of understanding um, how much uh, willingness to pay there is at different levels of, of, um, of construction um, and not just what they're willing to pay, um, but what they um, aspire to is, is, is important to understand anywhere. And, you know, businesses often try and succeed because they're given a kind of blueprint that they follow and, and that customers don't necessarily want. Um, so being able to connect the, the skill sets and the, um, the uh, capacities of, of businesses with the kind of demand for what they have um, that they can respond to, they can provide something that's attractive, is the is the place to start. And I think applies across the board. Um, and I think that's where we started seeing real success and, and real options for scale, uh, because we we could see that businesses were able to respond. We knew that we had something that would be profitable for them, but it didn't necessarily entail the the, the kind of perfect design solution that we may, may have wanted customers to have in the beginning. So I think that um, that evolved approach um, is, is very applicable almost anywhere you're working with businesses and households. Hi, everyone. Uh, John Sauer here from PSI. Uh, good morning, good evening. Hope everyone's doing great. Um, I just wanted to, uh, Jesse, you had a, an interesting question I saw in the in the chat for, for Dagam. Do you want to just come off mic and ask Dagam that question? Um, it doesn't look like we're able to activate his mic, uh, but if okay. you'd like me to oh. read it out loud, I can do that. Yeah. Great. Okay, Please good. Do, do. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, so this uh, question is from Jesse Shapiro. So interesting how the door-to-door -door sales model is scaling better than others and has the highest visibility. Why are some businesses giving up on 
uh, why are some businesses 21% giving up on this business? Yeah, I'll give that one for you. Yeah. Uh, actually, I mean, the 21% uh, uh, like dropout rate is for the past five years and looking at, you know, like for business startups, you know, I think this rate is really very uh, promising for sanitation business because unlike other models which were really attempted before, you know, like the concrete cast uh, based models were not really totally effective. Business will will definitely stop uh, continuing their doing their business after a year or two, especially when the program stops. So I think this is, you know, quite natural for a business like sanitation, which is like mostly a startup. And 21% is, I think, quite, quite very uh, low comparing to the, the business. So uh, on the sustainability, you know, like of business, this business model, we, we're looking at the, this business model being sustainable because we're looking at uh, people growing in these businesses. You know, some someone who started as a mason is growing to become a retailer. We are having his own manufacturing and trying to expand their businesses. And also when we see their reach, you know, Especially like while we, we were operating in transform much, we're, we're just limiting the, the intervention areas because we were operating in, 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 in some geographical context and we didn't want business to operate outside. But now we, we, we're trying to support these businesses to expand to other areas and business also naturally tends to grow and expand. So looking at uh, like in a, in, a, in a country like Ethiopia, which there is a lot, the the, the basic card sanitation coverage is very low, like 9% now. So there is a lot of business potential, and I don't see a business saturating uh, shortly. Thank you. I'll just quickly add to that the highest uh, rate of dropout was among the more advanced manufacturers who were creating the cement slabs. So we might expect that because that was the business model that wasn't succeeding as well um, in, in responding to customers' needs. It was the one that saw the least retention as our business partners, whereas the Mason installers had a very low uh, dropout rate. So it, it did follow what we expected in terms of the ability to succeed providing the, um, the products that they were. But I think there's a lot more that could be done to promote other higher value products as well. And I think with more promotion of that, we could potentially see a higher retention rate, even among those businesses that are providing the higher value products that may cost more. There may be a smaller customer base, but there could be more viability with the right attention to those businesses. Great, thank you. Um, next question, um, what would you advise as a service or business type for areas where open defecation is still a common practice. Uh, so what would be a first market step parallel with or right after a CLTSH approach? This approach we outlined, I think, is the one that's uh, most responsive to you know, just post CLTSH context. So, you know, you often see that with CLTSH, you, you get a good adoption of um, of sanitation, not basic, but, you know, very rudimentary level of sanitation. Um, but from there, in trying to connect households to market approaches beyond what they're able to do themselves with their own resources, own locally available resources, um, this approach of, of having a very small scale business, one or two people, uh, masons who go to door to door and can do these simple upgrades, starts to convince households that beyond what they've already created for themselves, there is a market solution. So these very simple small businesses with very affordable, inexpensive products that get them started on the journey to continuing to improve over time their toilets is a great place to make that transition from CLTSH to, to a market-based approach. Um, businesses start to see that there's a real customer base for themselves because there is already an installed base and they see that there are simple solutions that get them somewhere, you know, with limited resources of the households 
get them started and, and make them some money, but that over time, once that aspiration is developed and there's a desire by households to uh, invest more in, in, their, in their sanitation, the business can grow in new directions. You may provide something very simple and expensive in the beginning, but over time, if you continue to use the demand creation approaches you've used and, and be good at sales, um, you'll be able to, um, you'll have an open audience for more discussion about how to improve from there. Great, uh, Dagan, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Well, let's continue to the next one, okay. All right, great. Uh, so our next question is from Tabitha. Um, she says, my understanding is that often the very simple latrines that are self-dug in homes in rural Ethiopia can suffer from collapse after a short time. The door-to-door -door upgrades that Masons provide, do they address this issue? Or have you seen this as a problem where Sato pans have been installed on an unimproved substructure? Yeah, great question. And that's a, it's a perfect example of another set of products and services that can be offered to address a, a, a different issue. So clearly the door-to-door -door -door installation where you do basic uh, retrofits, where you might add in a set of doesn't address that issue, but um, there are product solutions that do. So for example, cement rings, we've done quite a bit of uh, training of our business partners around uh, how to create uh, cement rings as a pit lining solution. Um, there are other solutions as well, such as uh, old used uh, truck tires that can be used to uh, to line the pit. And there are others as well, other innovative ideas uh, for pit lining. In fact, Lixel has just come up with and is about to test with us a new set of uh, plastic products for uh, pit lining um, that we hope to get out there um, relatively soon um, and, and see how that could be a, an affordable solution as well and easy to train uh, businesses on. Um, so there are uh, other options and those fit more into the uh, the basic uh, construction or even the advanced construction business models. Those that have more established businesses have some space, can get access to molds. They can create a precast uh, cement rings or they can have other uh, you know product types that they can offer that would be perhaps beyond the you know simplest business model of the door-to-door -door installation but that could be added i mean that could be something that you know if a mason is reaching a certain amount of set, uh, set saturation in installing you know simple upgrades with set of hands um, having a product ready to be able to uh, support pit lining uh, solutions could be a great new place to go so, you know, there's a lot of talk about how well these businesses at some point are going to reach saturation. What happens then? You know, the, the more diversity of product uh, ranges that can be introduced through the businesses, the more they can learn about different ways to solve customers' problems, the more product they'll have ready and services to offer as uh, customers shift from what was first installed to what might you know, upgrade even then uh, what they have in the future um, to keep business thriving, keep business, businesses growing. I don't think there's a, a real end point to the kind of innovation these businesses could do to continually support the needs of uh, households uh, who would need their services. Uh, perfect. Um, next, we have a question from Dagan or for Dogum, uh, can you please speak more to why you saw the rise and then drop in average monthly sales for retailers? And are Masons sourcing Sato pans directly or are they sourcing from retailers? Thank you. It's really a very nice question. So, I mean, uh, that was really desirable, you know, because uh, retailers do two kind of sales. One is direct sales to households and the other one is uh, as for business to business. So what we saw earlier is, you know, the direct sales to households, which which is decreasing because, you know, most of the sales is, is being conducted through the masons and masons are doing installation because by when masons are buying the products, we can make we can make, can make sure that proper installation is being made and the direct sales to uh, household 
decreasing is really very desirable, desirable because we can make we we are sure that uh, products are being installed properly, and uh, we are also sure that products are not really sitting in 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 houses. In, in the households, you know, without being installed or being used. So that's why, you know, like, because the direct sales is really, really decreasing, that you think uh, the direct sales is really decreasing now because missile sales is uh, increasing. And also the questions that you ask it, you know, like missiles get their products from retailers, you know, from the, 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 the separate supply chain for the plastic products. Thank you. All right, we've gotten a couple questions in the chat about um, upgrades to the infrastructure. Um, Hannah asks, uh, did you see a trend of repeat customers who upgrade their infrastructure over time? And we had another question as well uh, from, from Jesse asking about upgrade options. Um, in other countries, USAID has found customers usually only want to invest one time in a latrine. So any, any uh, comments on that that's I can't say that we've tracked that and actually it's something I would love <laughs> to do I was just thinking in our next quality monitoring survey I want to ask a question of households uh, you know how many times they have purchased an upgrade um, right now our m and &E relies on uh, sales data from our business partners, so whether retailers, masons, other other businesses, um, they'll tell us how many product they sell to households, but we don't get data from that data set around repeat customers. Um, but to triangulate and to have you know an even richer source of data about quality of installation, you know where households heard about the products from, um, to understand more about how households are being served by our program, um, that would be a great question to add. And uh, and in the next one, I think we will to get a sense of whether we are getting repeat customers and we are getting repeated upgrades. So actually, thank you for that suggestion and stay tuned. Uh, I think that's something we um, would love to be studying and we'll um, add into our our, our our a list of things that we want to understand more about what's happening at the household level. Sorry, I don't have a, a an answer to that right now, but it is a, a great issue to understand more about. Dagum, I don't know if you have any anecdotal evidence. Um, I mean, like you, you see, like households do uh, do invest twice or three times even to get the basic upgrade. You know, like they invest on purchasing sato and they just invest on installing the sato You know, it's like. It, it, it's not like a one-time event investment even for upgrade it's like two two or three times because they just and this process takes a long period of time you know so i think we we need to have evidence actually to say this but i think there are some also who are willing to to invest more you know, because even upgrade is another investment that it, when when we say it's upgrades they must have had another investment before you know like a couple of years before so but as Monte mentioned, we're just going to collaborate this with evidence with uh, when we conduct as, as, uh, our surveys like next time. All right, I think we have time for one more question and I think this will be a good one to close us out with. Uh, from Genevieve Kelly, how many toilets do you aim to achieve by the new project end? Sorry, I didn't get the last part of the question. How many toilets? Uh, how many toilets do you aim to achieve by the new project end? Again, we uh, we we didn't get a new uh, any project. We just got an extension for uh, the next one year. So we we planning to to have more close to 50, 52,000 uh, toilets for the next one one year and three months. Uh, We'll have a, a a big a big a bigger aim, you know, like when uh, when when we have an upcoming project project maybe by twenty twenty three. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you.
Um, as John noted in the chat, if there are any questions um, for the presenters that you didn't see answered today, you are welcome to email Monty and Dagam directly. Um, those email addresses are in the chat. Uh, John? Hey, Katie, could I just say, yeah, well, first of all, thank you to everyone for joining today. And I, I want to just stress also that this is a, uh, a series, a webinar series. We're not, we, we realize there's a lot to cover, so we're going to take it kind of topic by topic. Um, we haven't fully defined what the, all the topics will be, but uh, we'll be sharing that information out shortly. So stay tuned and uh, we'll, we'll be back with a lot more content and a lot more webinars of these bite-sized um, webinars soon. So thanks everyone for, for joining today. And Katie, back, back to you. Thank you. Yes, thanks again, everyone, for joining. We will be sharing the recording of this um, and potentially other materials on Global Waters um, within the next few weeks. So do look out for that, but we'll also be emailing that to everyone who, um, who came today. This Katie, uh, link, oh yeah. I'm sorry, can I ask one last question? So there were a lot of, I tried to answer a few of the questions in the, um, that were in the Q&A box. Yeah. But I didn't. I wasn't able to get to all of them. When when the uh, webinar is shared back out, is there a way to actually like answer those questions offline? And then when the when the webinar is shared, it they're they're, they're yeah. All, okay, that's absolutely. Great. We'll we'll definitely collect all of these questions and try to develop a, a PDF or a document to address some of them to be sent out as well. Um, with this information. So, so you can actually capture all those questions, right? Perfect. Yes, yes. Thanks, Thanks so much. Um, now the link in the chat that I just put in there is the event page for today. Um, and that is going to be where the recording and other materials are hosted um, once they are available. Um, but before you sign off, uh, we do ask you to take a brief one question survey uh, to uh, provide any sort of feedback on today's webinar. Uh, we really enjoyed having all of you and uh, hope to see you back for a future TWASH webinar soon. Thanks, everyone. Good to be with you. Yeah, thank you, everyone.